What's up, Ben Salem? What's up, Ben Salem? What's up, Ben Salem? What's up, it's your boy Brandon Jackson. I'm Tamala Edwards from Action News. I'm Tony Danza. And you're watching. You're watching. And you're watching. OTN. OTN. Now Television Network. You're watching. I am Rhinos. We are Rhinos. We are Rhinos. Oh, me? Yeah, I'm a Rhino. We are Rhinos. I'm a Rhino. To be a Rhino or to be a cow? To be a cow. Or to be a rhino. Rhino, cow. Rhino, cow. Rhino, cow. Rhino. Charge! 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 Oh, yeah! Be a rhino! Be a rhino! That's cool. That is very, very cool. So can we get a copy of that to put on the uh, Rhino emails? Got it. All right, so tomorrow 10,000 people can see that. How's that? That'll be fun. Um, I want to thank you guys for having me today and have CJ. Uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing me here. It's really, really exciting. Uh, I understand you guys have had to do uh, writings based on the blogs and uh, go through some research on uh, Rhino Living, which is very exciting. It's always nice to get to speak to somebody who already knows a lot about what we're going to talk about. One of the reasons I'm here today, the most exciting thing for me is getting to speak to high schools and colleges. The reason being is because you guys are a completely clean slate. You can do anything in your life that you want to do. Anything. There is nothing impossible. There's no damage you've done thus far in your life that would prevent you from living your dreams in any capacity. So it's really awesome because you're getting to speak to people that have complete potential. You guys have unlimited potential to do anything you ever want to do in your life. Anything that's stopping you is all in your head. It's either in your friend's head, your family's head, your teacher's head, or your head, okay? But whatever you actually want to do with your life, you get to do. And that's the fun part. So who's controlling my slides for me? All you? All right, what's your first name? Corey. Corey? Thanks, Corey. Can you go to the next one? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you guys all the secrets to success. It doesn't matter what you want to do in your life. It doesn't matter if you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, a teacher, go work for the Peace Corps, open your own business. There's certain laws in life that you really need to follow. There's certain things you need to do and you'll be successful in anything that you want to be. So the very first thing is your attitude. You guys seem to have a pretty good attitude. Does everybody in here have a good attitude? All right, good. You have energy, you have enthusiasm. These are the things that really make a big difference. So here's Here's what's the, the truth about attitude. Attitude is really about 10% of what happens in life is really, you know, the issue. 90% is how you react to it. So 90% is how you choose to react to something. So you get a bad grade in school. You can spend your whole life moaning and whining and complaining, or you can take your 90% and make a good result out of it and change the outcome for the future. Right? Every single thing that happens to you in your life, you can either focus on all the negative or spend all your time focusing on the positive and solution. So bad stuff happens to people every single day. All right? I have about 850 employees right now. We're about to open another restaurant in two weeks. So you don't think on the car right here I had two or three bad calls. I had several good calls, but of course you have an architect call you and say, oh, this isn't going to get approved. You have an attorney call you and say, oh, this, is, this license isn't going to be issued to this day. You have somebody else call and say, oh, this isn't working right. So you have all these things that happen, and you can either focus on the negative or focus on the positive. People that focus on the positive, guess what they have? A fun, energetic, exciting life. That they, when they have a failure, they get back up and they find more positive. So, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. The most important thing is every single day you guys get to change your attitude, okay? You get to change it, you get to choose it, you get to live whatever attitude you want. The one thing you really control in life is your attitude, okay? Can you guys control your class schedule? Can you control the homework your teachers put on you? Okay. Can you control what admissions is going to say at college? No. You do get to choose your attitude. 
The attitude that you embrace for the day will determine how good and positive your day is. Next slide. So this is the Rhino attitude. Have you guys seen this before? It's in the Rhino book. We have it on the website. You can actually print it out from the website. This is my favorite quote. I've used it in every business I've ever run. And what it says is, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, than giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. There the remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we'll embrace for that day. You cannot change the past. You cannot change the inevitable. The only thing you can do is play the one string we have, and that is your attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. You are in charge of your attitude. The great thing about this is it's a big equalizer. Okay? There may be somebody in this, in this room who's number one in the class. There may be somebody in this room who's number 200 in the class. All right, guess what? When you get out in the real world, sometimes the guy who's number 200 in class has the most successful and happiest life. And the guy who's number one in class spends his life working in a research lab, working for somebody else for his entire life. Okay? So the issue is, is that your attitude really determines your aptitude and your altitude and everywhere that you're going to go in life. So I know guys who are filthy, filthy rich, worth two, three hundred million dollars, who have a high school diploma, who grew up in Philadelphia and just made their life. Okay? And made their success. And I know friends who have complete, the, the best grades, they, came, or they graduated from a great college, they grew up in the best neighborhood, and they have a miserable life. The difference is their attitude, what they chose to do and accomplish with their life. Next slide. So let's talk about being a cow or a rhino. This is really exciting because every day you get to choose this. Really important is choosing who you hang out with, number one. Okay, so number one, you become the average of the 10 people you spend the most time with. So if you spend all of your time with losers, guess what you're probably going to be? A loser, okay? You spend your time around great, energetic, happy people, guess what you're going to be? A great, energetic, happy person. So let's talk first about what you do as a rhino. You wake up in charge in the morning rather than hit snooze. How many people like getting up early in the morning? I don't particularly like it, okay? But you roll out of bed and you figure out something positive to think of. If the first thought in your morning is something that you like, guess how much better your morning starts? A lot better, all right? So the cow hits snooze as many times as they can, all right? Which means that they've already started off their day slow. They've already started off their day without energy, without enthusiasm, without focusing on something good. The cool thing about rhinos, they hang around with busy, exciting people. The cows, guess who they hang out with? People that like to complain, all right? People that like to complain, you know what they're just trying to do? They're trying to justify their lack of action. They're trying to explain why they're not doing things, okay? So the cow says, man, I failed that test. I failed the test because the teacher's a jerk and the teacher can't teach. No, you failed the test because you stayed up last night playing Wii instead of studying, okay? Now, busy rhino people, they surround themselves around other energetic, positive people that will also hold them accountable, that will let them know when they're slacking, all right? They bring them to a higher level. The cool thing about a rhino, there's no distractions. Why a rhino has survived this long, okay? A rhino is basically a prehistoric animal, correct? All right, there's nothing else like it. It's the second largest land mammal, and basically nothing can stop it. When a rhino sees something it wants, it charges nonstop till it gets it. And it's why, instead of becoming extinct, it's found a way to survive this many years. The cow always sees obstacles. The cow says, hey, I want to go to this college, but. Hey, I'd like to get this job, but. Hey, I'd like to go do this this weekend, but. The cow will always find little roadblocks. And what I have to tell you is life is full of tons of roadblocks. Little ones, big ones, okay, there's always going to be roadblocks. If you focus on the roadblock and you stop looking at the goal, you stop moving forward. So what the rhino does is the rhino sees the goal and sees nothing else. So if you decided that in your last year of school you wanted to get straight A's and that was going to be your goal, the entire time you're focused on that, that's all you're thinking about. Straight A's, straight A's, straight A's. So obstacles and things that slow you down, they just temporarily block you because you know you're going to get there. And that's the rhino mentality. The cool thing about being a rhino as well, you're always alert for opportunities and excitement. Okay? That's why Mr. Mills and I are friends, because we're always looking for cool things to do and you just bump into people in this little town of Philadelphia. Believe it or not, Philadelphia is a really small town and there's only so many people doing great stuff. 
and doing exciting things. So you all end up bumping into each other. Okay? One of my good friends is Pat Croce, and we had always been told by other friends we had that, oh, we got to get you guys together, we got to get you guys together. And we just hadn't gotten together yet. And how did we bump into each other? He has a house in Key West, I have a house two blocks from him in Key West, and we just bumped into each other one day right on the street in front of our homes. Okay? We were meant to bump into each other. That's really cool because people that are looking for opportunities and cool, exciting stuff, they end up bumping into each other. The cows, on the other hand, rationalize away every opportunity that comes to them. I can't afford it. I can't work that hard. I have this is in the way, that is in the way. And guess who they end up meeting? Nobody except other people that are complaining and rationalizing their way their life, okay? So, other thing about being a rhino, rhinos are happy and healthy. They don't take sick days. They don't make excuses. They just keep going no matter what. All right? Rhinos are actually too busy to get sick because life is too much fun. All right. The cow, on the other hand, is always, oh, I don't feel good today. Oh, this is bad today. Oh, the weather's horrible. How bad is the weather today? I got to tell you, it was not fun driving from Westchester to Benzale today on a gray, rainy day through construction and car accidents and everything. But you find a way to make it positive rather than focus on the negative. Here's another important fact about being a rhino. And I guarantee you, if you absorb this one principle, it will completely change your life. The rhino goes the extra mile. The rhino does more than they're paid for or more than is expected of them. The cow puts the least amount of effort possible. This is a huge difference in people's lives. What the rhino does is the rhino always does more than is expected, which means in the long run, the rhino keeps getting more and more back. The cow says, I'm going to do the least amount of effort possible, and then wonders why they never get anywhere in life. This is really, really true in the workforce. Okay, how many people have part-time jobs here? Okay, full-time jobs, part-time jobs. How do you get promoted at work? Do you get promoted at work by getting there 10 minutes late, leaving 10 minutes early, not finishing and doing what you were supposed to do, whining and complaining, being a pain to your boss? Or do you get a promotion by getting there 10 minutes early, staying 10 minutes late? doing everything properly the first time and being there to help. That's how everything works in this world. It doesn't matter what you do. If you continue to go the extra mile and do more than is expected, the great thing is the universe turns around and gives you a whole bunch of rewards all the time. Okay? I've used that principle in every business I've ever developed. I used to be a chiropractor before I had restaurants and bars. And when I was a chiropractor, I used to see 800 patients a week. Your average chiropractor sees 100 patients a week. But my policy in my office was I took all patients regardless of money or ability to pay. So if you came in with insurance, great. If you came in without insurance, it didn't matter to me. I just took care of you. That was my job as a chiropractor. So I just went the extra mile with every single patient. And then what happened? All my patients just kept sending me more and more what? Patients. More and more people came in because they're like, hey, he's a good, honest guy. He'll do everything that you need to have done. So then the universe kept taking care of me and I had the big, biggest practice in this part of the state. All right. And then we got in the restaurant business. And guess what? I was supposed to open three restaurants in five years. Three. And we opened ten in five years. Why? Because with our guests and with our employees and with everything we did, we tried to always go the extra mile and go above and beyond. So what happened? Opportunities kept coming our way. So going the extra mile principle works whether you're working part-time in the mall or at a CVS or at a restaurant or if you own your own business or if you're a teacher or if you're in college. If you do more than is expected, you will always get more in return. The next thing about being a rhino or a cow, rhinos accept responsibility. The quicker you accept responsibility rather than blaming others, the quicker you get to a solution. Whenever we have something go wrong in our life, you know what we do? The first thing we do is ignore it, right? Let's admit it, if you guys know that you're like going into your last semester and you have like, you know, you need to get your grade up 10 or 20% and you know it, what do you do though for the first couple weeks? You ignore it, right? You sort of pretend it's not the case and you just ignore it, okay? The next thing we do is recognize it, but deny it. Oh yeah, it's there, but we're just gonna pretend it's not there. I now have acknowledged it. I'm no longer ignoring it, but I'm gonna still deny it exists. The next thing we love to do is blame others. It's not my fault I have this grade. It's not my fault this happened, mom or dad. It's not my fault, it's so-and-so's fault, and we blame somebody else. And then miraculously, somewhere you get somewhere where you accept responsibility. And guess what happens when you accept responsibility? You start moving forward and you start fixing stuff. So the thing about life is the quicker you accept responsibility for anything you do, the quicker you find the solution. So I make mistakes all the time. The biggest thing you have to realize about successful people is they make mistakes all the time. 
Okay? Mr. Mills and I have run businesses and we've done well at them and we've done bad at them sometimes, right? We've made some good choices, we've made some bad choices. That's life. But the cool thing is, is every day we get up and play the game. But when you make a bad decision, we don't blame other people. We say, yep, I made that decision. I chose to let that person rent off me. I chose to hire that employee. I chose to develop this menu. Whatever it happens to be. So you make mistakes all the time, but the quicker you say, okay, mistakes there, I see it. I take ownership of it, the faster you get solutions. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. The faster you get solutions, guess what? The bigger impact you make. So let's go to the next slide real quick. I'm going to give you guys four secret laws of success. If you've got a pen and paper, write these down. And I guarantee you, if you don't break these laws in life, if you follow these simple four laws in life, life will be a lot more fun. I can absolutely guarantee it. It'll be a lot more fun, it'll be a lot more exciting, and you'll get to do all the stuff you want to do. Anybody here want to travel the world? Is that something you'd like to do? Okay. So you can put that on your list. All right. Anybody here want to make a million dollars? Raise your hand. Ten million dollars? Important money question, okay? I want to let you guys know, I grew up poor. I did not grow up with uh, a whole bunch of wealth. I didn't grow up with money in the bank for college. My mom raised me and my two sisters in a basement apartment, and every time they raised the rent, we moved to the next basement apartment, okay? We had to pick the basement apartment because we couldn't afford, afford the apartment with the balcony, okay? So I want you to know that people don't come from wealth. It's really about making your own dreams come true. So in this room, raise your hand if you believe by the time you're 50 years old, you could have a million dollars in the bank. Okay. Now, here's what's sad. When you're 50 years old, a million dollars in the bank isn't going to be anything. All right? You in this room, you could have $10 million in the bank by the time you're 50. And guess what? You could still do it by doing something you love. You could be a social worker and still accumulate $10 million by the time you're 50. Because guess what? You can develop hobbies, part-time jobs, other things that can supplement your, link, your income. So financially, what I want you to believe is whatever your financial goal is, you can achieve it. Okay? What I'd also like to say is what my accountant told me when I was fresh out of chiropractic school in 1996. I said to him, here's what I want to do. I want to pay off all my homes, all my office buildings, everything I have, and I want to have a million dollars in the bank, and then I'm going to retire. I'm going to take it easy. All right? Not retire, but work part-time. He goes, no, you're not. You're going to add a zero to that number. He goes, and then you're going to double that number. And that's what happens as you get successful in life. You keep finding other things to do. All right? But what's important is I want you guys to realize that any financial goal you set, you truly can obtain. And it doesn't matter where you grew up. It doesn't matter what your grades are. It doesn't matter anything about that. There is a way to be successful in life. So first law of the jungle. Can you go to the next slide? This is the number one law of success. The law of cause and effect. And what this says is if you establish positive causes, you'll get positive results in your life. That life is not random. Okay, do you think people are just lucky? Like, do you look at me and just think, I'm, oh, he's lucky? Okay, I worked really hard to get here, but I also established certain positive causes that maybe not have to work as hard as some other people. Okay? So let's look at this. It's sort of like planting seeds. If you have a farm and you plant corn seed, you don't go back in three months looking for pumpkins, correct? You don't. But in your own life, guess what you do? You make the bad decisions, you hang out with the wrong people, and then you expect, miraculously, you're going to have a great life. You have to establish positive causes. So everything you do now, you get rewarded or punished for in the future. So do you want to have a more positive life? Do you want to live more of your dreams? Guess what you do? Set up more positive causes. It's that easy. Do more good every day than bad, and guess what you'll get in your future? More good. It makes sense, right? If you continually do bad, it'll catch up with you at some point. So life's not completely random. So basically, success and failure happens based on the causes you establish. In the long run, there are no accidents. You're compensated in proportion to the energy you give out. This whole entire universe is all about energy. Everything about us is energy, energy moving in and out. The reason why Mr. Mills and I get along so well is because we share a similar energy. We vibrate at the same frequency. We resonate well together. Okay? Same thing's true here. You put out positive energy, you're going to get back positive energy. Have you ever known somebody who's miserable? An aunt, an uncle, a friend, a relative, whoever it is, okay? Aren't they always miserable? And doesn't bad stuff happen to them all the time? So use that as your model to not become that. Next slide. 
All right, law of attraction. Has anybody here ever seen The Secret? Seen The Secret? Read the book The Secret? Okay. Heard of The Secret? We're watching it this weekend. You are? Okay. You're going to watch The Secret. And the one thing when you're watching The Secret that I want you to realize is you need to be aware of the fact that the most important part of the uh, word attraction is action. It's not just in your brain, it also requires action. Because action puts energy in motion and actually starts the ball rolling. The law of attraction is very important. And basically what the law of attraction says is that like attracts like. Okay, That people that vibrate at a certain, certain frequency connect to other people at that frequency. All right. This makes a lot of sense. Think of yourselves. Anybody here listen to President Steve in the morning? Okay. So we got a couple President Steve people. Okay. If you got up in the morning and you put your radio on Q102, are you going to hear President Steve? No. Okay. Why not? Because they're they're vibrating. They're sitting at a frequency at 93.3. Is there anything wrong with President Steve? Is there anything wrong with the show? The show's there. It's waiting for you guys to listen, but you're not tuned in. The law of attraction is that same principle. If you walk around all the time putting out good energy, putting out positive enthusiasm, good positive person, guess who listens to you? Other good positive people. Guess who you repel? Negative people. You repel negative situations and negative people when you're putting out positive energy. So basically, picture yourself walking around all the time with an antenna sticking out of your head. And what you're thinking and what you're feeling actually transmits out that antenna. And it really does. So it's really, real important. Have you ever met somebody and you're like, man, I just don't get a good vibe about that person? Have you ever had that? Have you ever met somebody and felt like somebody didn't like you? Have you ever had that happen? Guess what? They don't. Their subconscious mind is actually sending out a signal to you saying, I don't like your clothes, or I don't like your height, or I don't like your weight, or I don't like your hair, or whatever it is. Okay? So that's that vibrational energy. So you want to have good vibes basically your entire life. So the law of attraction basically says what you think about with energy and emotion you will bring about. So you essentially manifest the things that you think about with the most energy. So, if you spend all your life saying, I want to have a million dollars in the bank by the time I'm 35 years old, and you think about that consistently with energy and emotion, guess what? This law will bring things into your life to allow you to get there. Because you'll be more alert for opportunities. Okay? If you said, I want to get into this college, anybody here a freshman right now? Sophomore? What do we have? Okay, sophomores. You guys try this law every single day. Put a little note card in your desk. Anybody want to list what college they want to get into? Any sophomores here know what college they want to go to? I want to go to Temple. All right, so you want to go to Temple, all right? So there's thousands of people that want to go to Temple, right? Thousands of people are going to apply, and they're going to have to accept you. So what you want to do is every day, I want to go to Temple University. I want to go to Temple University. And guess what? It becomes programmed in your brain. And then what do you start attracting to yourself? The opportunities to go there. And when something happens in school where you might make the wrong decision, you automatically make the right decision. Why? Because your brain's programmed for what? Temple. Temple University. Okay? Longer range thinking. All successful people have a longer range thought process. They think about where they're going to be in three to five years. And that way they make the right decisions along the way. All right, and guess what? If you keep thinking about Temple University, you're gonna be attracted to people that want to help you get there. Really weird stuff will happen, like all of a sudden you'll bump into somebody at Wawa who's a professor at Temple, and you never would have noticed had you not been vibrating this out. Happens all the time. Like crazy all the time, right? Like, like one of Mr. Mill's friends wanted to get in touch with me about a restaurant that one of his friends has open, because he knows me, I know him, all these things happen, and I had actually been thinking about calling him the day before. And one of Mr. Mill's friends goes, oh, so-and-so wants to call you, and I said, I was just going to call him the other day. Random out of nowhere, but it's because you're on that frequency. Next slide. Law of persistence. Anybody here ever fail? Anybody here ever have something go wrong? Okay? It's a whole new world. This is a new attitude. Failure is awesome. I don't want you guys to fail out of school. Don't go to your teachers today and say, hey, David Grogan said I should fail everything. Okay? What failure is, it's how you learn. It's how you become better. All right? And I guarantee if you're a straight A student right now and you go to college, you're going to have some setbacks in college. All right? And you need those setbacks. If not, life's easy street for you and you're never going to appreciate stuff. All right? As you continue to challenge yourself, you have to fail along the way. You absolutely have to fail. I have failed. Okay? And guess what? The failures have made every business I've ever had more profitable. 
So to give you guys a good idea, in 2008, it was the worst restaurant year in 30 years. Guest traffic in restaurants were the lowest level since the 1970s. Fuel prices went up, the economy crumbled, everything just went to hell, all right? So it was the worst year in the restaurant industry in a year. You know what it made us do? It made us close bad units that we should have closed before that were draining our energy. It made us get rid of the bad people in our company, and it made us become more efficient. Well, 2010 has been a really good year, and guess what? We're making more money in 2010 than we made in 2007 because we're more efficient. We never would have gotten so efficient if what? It was always easy street. So failure is a way for you to get better. The way you want to think about life is in life, if you're still writing stuff down, a little thing, cool thing to draw is just a hill and a valley, okay? In life, you're gonna have peaks and valleys all the time. Sometimes you're on top, sometimes you're on the bottom, okay? Guess where the better space to be is? The bottom. Because once you're at a peak, guess what? You can't go to the next peak without heading to some kind of valley. What the valley does is it teaches you what you need to do to go up above. When you're on the peak, everything is just flying. It's super fast, you're doing great. You know, we were opening up these Kildare's units that were doing three, four million dollars a year. They were awesome, it was just, they're like going crazy, they're printing money, everything's nuts. And then you have a couple bad apples and you're like, all right, what's wrong with this? And then it makes you learn to tweak and it makes you make different decisions in the future. All right? So the valley, the failure time, is when you actually learn how to be better for the next peak. So you go from a peak to a valley, but guess what? Your next peak's even higher. And it's higher because you've learned and you've evolved. So that's where persistence comes in. And what persistence tells you is you are gonna fail a lot in life. The more you fail, the better. Because it means you're moving forward. All right? And as you move forward, guess who you're gonna make feel really uncomfortable? Are the cows. So the more people that are uncomfortable with what you're doing, the more forward you're moving. It's a good thing. So look at Abraham Lincoln. Have you guys ever heard this before? All right, amazing how many times he failed in life. All right, in 31 he failed in business. In 32 he failed for state legislator. Tried another business in 33, he failed. Fiance died in 35. Had a nervous breakdown in 36. How many people would have given up if this was your five years? Okay, high school's four years, right? Look what happened to this guy in five years. Can you imagine for four years of high school having this happen to you? All right, and he kept getting up and going. In 43, he ran for Congress and was defeated. The amazing thing about Abraham Lincoln is what a rhino he was. How did he even think he deserved to run for Congress? Didn't he basically fail at everything? So what was his platform? Would he get up and stand up and talk to people and say, I failed at this business, I failed at this, I failed at this. Let me run your government. All right, so then he failed again. He, was try he tried in 48, he defeated again. He tried running for Senate in 55, he lost. The next year he ran for Vice President, he lost. In 59 he ran for Senate again and lost. In 1860 he became the President of the United States. Fresh off of failures. Now what you don't see here is what Abraham Lincoln looked at in the mirror every day. And for every failure here, he had two or three amazing successes. So guess what, when he failed in one business, he became the CEO of somebody else's business that did very well. When he failed at national politics, he excelled at local politics. He became the most powerful legislator in Illinois. So although he had a lot of failures, and although the press could have written an article like this, saying what a loser this guy is, he chose to get up every morning and look at the positive things he did. And the reason he was able to be such a great president wasn't all his previous success, it was all his previous failures. Do you think that any other guy could have stomached what he had to stomach to change the world? When he came in as president, he completely changed the world, forever, as president. Had he not suffered through all that, there's no way he would have had the guts to do it. Does that make sense to everybody? So failure, please take it, welcome it, and then use it to go further. What's important about failure as well, you failing at something does not make you a failure. Failure is a good part of life. So don't think that when you mess up, you're a failure. All right, next slide. The law of abundance. This goes back to going the extra mile, all right? People sometimes think that like, oh, only so-and-so can get rich, or only so-and-so can get this job, or only so-and-so gets this opportunity, okay? There's abundance for everybody. It's more about your mentality than it is about the reality of the world. If you think abundantly, if you think there's plenty, guess what, there is. If you think there's nothing, guess what, there is. If you think you can't have great things in your life, if you think there's nothing good coming your way, guess what, you're attracting that. 
We talked about the law of attraction, right? If your dominant thought is, I don't deserve this, life's not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not from the right side of the tracks, whatever it has to, happens to be, guess what you send out? Hi, I'm a loser. Would you like to come be a loser with me? Okay? If you start to send out, hey man, life is awesome, there's plenty to go around, I can live the life I dream, I get to do whatever I want in my life, this is going to be a great ride. Guess what you attract? Other people to go on that great ride with. Okay? It's awesome. So, it's really important, the law of abundance, that there's plenty to go around. I won't, don't want you guys to think that there's only like finite amounts of success and happiness in the world. There's tons of it. All right? And it also doesn't matter what economic time you're in. All right? Bill Gates started Microsoft in a recession. Okay? In the highlight of 2007, we were opening one or two restaurants a year, and that's when the economy was awesome for restaurants. This year is probably the second worst year in the restaurant industry, and we're opening five restaurants this year. Five. You know why? Because so many places are going out of business, so many landlords need tenants. Guess what? It's easy for us to make great deals. So what used to cost me $2 million two years ago now cost me $500,000. Right? So it's all about opportunity. So there's always abundance. You just have to figure out a way to do it. So every time you think there's not a solution, look at it the other way and say there has to be. So if you give more than you receive, if you go the extra mile, you'll constantly have more than you need. The way I used to think about it as a chiropractor is I used to imagine like a piggy bank in the sky. So let's say I came in and, and let's say Mr. Mills was a patient of mine and he was a car accident patient and the car accident insurance was paying me $75 every time I adjusted him. And then let's say you came in and you're like, hey man, I go to Temple, I've got no money. I'd say, hey, don't worry about it. You know, when you're rich, what do you want to go to Temple for? Um, okay, but let's say you go to Temple and you go for film and you become a big rich Hollywood producer, right? And I, and I say, oh, don't worry about it. You're a student, don't pay me anything. And one day when you're rich, come take care of me, right? So I'm getting reimbursed for taking care of Mr. Mills directly. I take care of him totally for free. But what you realize is you can't give things away for free. That if there's a value, the value obviously will always come back to you. So I always used to look at it sort of like a piggy bank in the sky. Like I'm taking care of him for free and it was sort of like depositing money in this fake bank up in the universe. And guess what? Whenever I needed something, it sort of came back. I would go and cash something out. Okay? Just as I had showed kindness to somebody else, I would be shown kindness in the future in some way. And that's where so many opportunities come from. If you continually give others opportunities and you treat them well, more and more opportunities come back your way. And I know a lot of people think the world is like, you know, take as much as you can get and protect yourself and do all this and be a mean business person, this, that, and the other. The more great opportunities you give others, the more opportunities come back, right? So there's everything you ever want in your life is there. The important thing is that everything that you want actually wants you, as long as you believe you deserve it. So if you say to yourself, I want to move to California and I want to do X, Y, and Z, whatever it happens to be. I want to be a movie star, I want to be in a rock band, whatever it is. Okay? So you want to move to LA, you want to start a rock band, you want to be a rock star. All right? Guess what? If you really honestly believe it and you really, really want it and you don't carry around a bunch of self-doubt and you're willing to persist, guess what you could be one day? You could be a rock star. Okay? If you don't believe it, there's a guy that you guys probably know who was a very bad busboy for me. Okay? We couldn't even promote him to server. When we tried to promote him to server, he wasn't good enough. But he was really good friends with a friend of mine, and my friend said, hey man, can you help him out? You know, he's a rapper and stuff like that. Skinny little white kid, he was like 20 years old. Hey, can you help my buddy out? He just needs a job. He's really focused on trying to get, trying to get rap, you know, do rap and stuff. Can you get him a busboy job? I'm like, yeah, you know what, he's a nice kid. We'll make him a busboy. He worked for us for a while, and we're like, all right, we'll make him a server. He wasn't a very good server, okay? Wasn't a good bar back. Uh, all of a sudden, he got picked up by a record label. Things still weren't great, all right? Wasn't a great record label, wasn't a great contract. I remember getting to look at the very first contract that was offered to him. It was not a good contract, okay? And he goes, moves to Atlanta. He's delivering pizzas, because he's still a rap star in training with a record contract, now delivering pizzas. He's delivering pizzas to homes, and he's starting to hear his song play at, this, at the homes he's delivering pizza to. And that guy was Asher Roth. You guys all know who Asher was, right? Four years ago, three years ago, Asher Roth was clearing your plate at Kildare's Pub. Talk about living your dreams, right? And he came back and played homecoming at Westchester at Kildare's 
about three months, two months before I Love College hit it big. Now he had a following in Westchester, but I gotta tell you, we didn't even fill the whole pub. So three months before Asher was big, there was about a hundred of his friends that couldn't wait to see him. But he still couldn't fill a pub that only fit 300 people. And three months later, he had the number one iTunes song in the country. Six months later, he's going to the VMA Awards. Okay? Two months later, he's emailing me pictures that he's at P. Diddy's house. Okay? How crazy is that about how six... But you know what? He believed in himself. And he came, when he came at that homecoming, he's like, I don't know, Atlanta's pretty tough. I'm thinking about coming home. I go, Asher, you were a bad busboy. You weren't really good at it. Okay? This is what you're meant to do. You're really good at this? Just stick it out. Who cares if you wait tables to deliver pizza as you're living your dream? Okay? If it's paying your daily bills and you get to live your dream. So I want you guys to realize, one, how rapidly it can happen. And two, how just when you think things are really bad, all of a sudden you have the number one iTunes song. All right? Really, really important. Next slide. My imagination creates my reality. So I gave you guys the four laws, right? If you wrote everything down, I've got some books to give away. So the people that remember stuff will get some books. So I gave you the four laws of success. What I'm telling you about those four laws is don't break them. All right? So follow the law of cause and effect. Always do more positive than negative, okay? Live the law of abundance. Realize there's tons out there for you, okay? Practice persistence. Every time you fail, get back up and get back up harder and stronger. That's why we want you to be a rhino. You're 6,000 pounds, you have six inch thick skin, what's gonna hurt you? Nothing. So every time you get knocked down, it's a lesson. It doesn't damage you. You get back up and you go, okay? And the next one was the law of attraction, all right? That like attracts like. And I really want you guys to realize, for your entire life, you do become the average of the 10 people you spend the most time with, okay? You choose to hang out with 10 millionaires, guess what you'll probably become in your life? A millionaire, okay? You choose to hang out with 10 drug addicts, and you don't believe in drugs, and you don't use drugs, at some point in your life, what are you probably going to become? A drug addict, okay? So it's really, really important who you choose to spend your time with. All right, so my imagination creates my reality. There's an excellent book I highly recommend about any level of success you ever want to achieve in your life. What's that? Do you guys know Napoleon Hill? What's the book? One of the best books about success ever written. Why? Because it teaches you that success is all inside. So who's read the book? Okay. It's not the easiest book to read. My book's a lot easier to read. Okay. It's a great book to read. I highly recommend it. All right. And what Napoleon Hill basically states is that there's no limitations to the mind except those we acknowledge. Both poverty and riches are the offspring of thought. What Napoleon Hill got to do is he got to spend his life with the wealthiest, most intelligent people of his time, from Henry Ford to Thomas Edison to presidents. Okay? Do you guys actually know that one of the people that helped break the Great Depression was Napoleon Hill? That Napoleon Hill worked for the president at the time. And Napoleon Hill's, one of his job was to get people's mentality to change. And what they actually did is they reached out to all the churches all across the country and had asked the pastors to change the message from gloom and doom to more positive, to inspire people, to help change the mentality of the nation during one of the worst economic times. And simply by helping to change the mentality, you start to change the result. You start to what? Attract more positive things. So, what Napoleon Hill basically teaches you is that whatever you believe with intense desire, you will manifest in your life. So basically what that means is whatever you mentally, mentally want very strongly with true emotion and conviction, you will actually create in your life. Okay? Very important. Uh, next slide. So here's how it works. I want to give you guys a quick little secret in how it all works. You have your frontal lobe in your brain, right? Your brain is where you have your ideas. So if you had an idea today that said, hey, I want to come up with this great thing, or I want to write this song, or I want to draw this picture, or I want to do this when I grow up, that's a frontal lobe idea, okay? That's your conscious mind saying, hey, here's our idea. But for any idea to become reality, it has to go into your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is what does all the work. Do you ever wake up in the morning with like an idea? Or do you ever have an idea and you can't keep that idea? Like you have this great idea and then a day later you're like, oh, what was my great idea? Remember, what was I talking about? That's a subconscious mind thought. That's basically like a thought flash. That's like your brain working for you. If you ever have a really hard problem you're trying to figure out, the best thing to do is think about it all day, work on it, whatever you're going to do. Go to sleep and in the morning a lot of times you have the solution. 
That's your subconscious mind working. So basically your subconscious mind is what directs you. We talked about Temple University for you, right? So if Temple University is always at the forefront of your subconscious mind, all of your thinking thoughts and all the actions you take will somehow align to that. So basically you can find yourself in a, in a situation that would not allow you to a temple. Let's say you're gonna make a bad choice. All right? And that bad choice, all of a sudden your subconscious mind goes, hey dude, uh, we have here in the list top priorities. Uh, meet hot girls, go to Temple University, get a cool car. Uh, this decision here you're gonna make, this thing's gonna mess up that Temple University thing you told us is so important. It becomes automatic. This is how success becomes a habit. If you take a frontal lobe thought and you bury it deep in who you are, that's how successful people become really successful. Take a look at Donald Trump. Donald Trump has two things programmed in his brain, his subconscious mind. A tendency to overspend and drive himself to bankruptcy, but another tendency to always be successful and rich. So Donald Trump is wired and programmed to be rich and successful. It's who he is, but you know what? It's who his subconscious brain is, so he can't even live outside of that. He can't even live outside of what it is. It's so in the core of who he is. So if your goal is to become a doctor, you start programming your subconscious mind that you are a doctor, that this is the kind of doctor you want to be, that these are the things that you want to do. And guess what starts happening in your life? All your frontal lobe decisions are relevant to that. Okay? So if one thing you want to do is buy a car, anybody here want to buy a car? Okay? Or did your parents all give you cars? Okay? Didn't happen, didn't happen in my life either. Okay? So who wants, to, who wants to list a dream car? Who's got a car they really want to buy? Okay, you want a Mitsubishi Lancer. Are you working for it? Are you saving for it? It's a predominant thought, right? When do you want to have it by? Okay, so every day it's somehow in your thoughts, isn't it? If you're coming to school, do you see them on the road everywhere? Like I gotta tell you, I'm trying to picture a Mitsubishi Lancer in my head right now and I really can't, okay? But I guarantee you, if you were walking to school today or driving to school today, you could see 10, right? And I could be sitting right next to you and not notice one, right? It's a top priority to her. So what her subconscious mind is doing is every time one pops up, it says, hey, look at that, look at that, look at that. All right? The other thing is, whenever she's making economic choices or decisions in her life, she says, how's this going to affect my ability to get a car? Is that true? Okay. You weigh and you judge it. It becomes a priority. Everything in your life can become a priority if you just get it into your subconscious brain. So here's the other thing. Your subconscious brain is very powerful. Therefore, it doesn't want to work on a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. So if you don't really believe it, guess what? Your subconscious brain isn't going to make it happen. Like, I believe you're going to get a Mitsubishi Lancer, okay? Why? Because right away your hand went up, you smiled about it, which means you have positive emotion about it, and when I ask you little questions, you immediately nod at your head. You're programmed. You didn't have to think. Your eyes didn't look up in any direction once. It was automatically like, yep, I'm doing this, okay? It's like if you said, I'm going to go to this college. I know I'm going to go to this college, and that's what you've been planning for. Okay, since ninth grade, you'll get there. But here's the thing about your subconscious mind. It doesn't want to work on stuff that's useless. So if you say, hey, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, it's, it's beach season soon, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose 10 pounds. That's what I wanna do. Your subconscious mind is like, you hate to run, you're gonna get up and run for a week and then you're gonna quit. You love pizza, you especially love pizza at 10 o'clock at night, you're not gonna give that up. So guess what the subconscious mind says? Psh, no way. Now let's say, historically, every spring you drop 10 pounds for the summer. You have that same conversation with your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind says, yep, you know what? You will lose the 10 pounds. I'll remind you when you're about to eat that pizza late not to. I'll push you to get out of bed in the morning. This is all the little things your subconscious mind does. So if your subconscious mind buys in and says, hey, this is part of who we are, the alarm goes off and you jump out of bed and you go to run. If the subconscious mind doesn't buy in, your subconscious mind's like, hey man, hit snooze. <laughs> You're not going to commit to this anyway. It's true in all aspects of life. So like in my life, right now opening restaurants is a huge priority. Okay, huge priority. Which means every day I find different opportunities. Every single day. It's almost like I can't have a conversation with somebody without finding out about a restaurant spot. Because that's just who I am. Okay? And anything you want to do in your life, program it in your subconscious mind, it becomes who you are. And that makes success easy. Okay? That's why successful people just become more and more successful.
You know, I look at actually somebody like Chris Rock, okay, who started out on Saturday Night Live, wasn't really that funny on Saturday Night Live, didn't have a great career. If you look at how stable and successful Chris Rock's career is, and you watch him on shows like Larry King or you watch him on Bill Maher, the guy is just 100% programmed to do what he does well, and he knows it, and he's programmed to it. Another person like that I've gotten to meet is Bono. Okay, I got to go to Barcelona this year for the rehearsal show of U2. My friend works for U2. Awesome. But I got to tell you, when you're in, we're at the after party and you two's here, those guys are madmen professionals, man. They, those guys are rock and roll business. They're not like crazy nut rock stars, like totally living an excess life. Those guys are programmed to be great at what they do. And it's amazing to be in that presence because you know that it's all just who they are. They can't be any other way. So next one. Here's the way it works. You get an idea, it goes to your subconscious brain. If it gets in there and, it, and your subconscious brain believes this is who you are, then you get to do those things in your life. All right? A lot of what determines that is the limits that you put on yourself. All right? The reason I love to get to speak to high school students, the reason I love to, is because I want you guys again to know there are no limits. There's nothing about where you're from, what you've done this far, or anything that could prevent you from being the next Bill Gates, the next Donald Trump, the next Michael Jordan, it doesn't matter, okay? I can't be the next Michael Jordan, I didn't have height, okay? There are real world limits, okay? So here's what you wanna look at. This outside box is the areas of real possibility. The real limits of the real world, all right? What most of us do is we box ourselves in. I'm no good at this. I'm not as pretty as her. I'm not as smart as this guy. I'm not as tall as this guy. I'm not as athletic as this. Boom, boom, boom. I can't get financing. I can't do this. All these things. What we do is we have real world limits. The real limits of economic times. The real limits of how long it takes to achieve something. Those are real. And then what do we do? We stop believing in ourselves and we do what? and we shrink in. So that's how most people live their life. So let's say you wanted to go to Temple, all right? Can you go to the next slide for me real quick? If you're a great peak performer, okay? We use Chris Rock as an example. We use Bono as an example, okay? If you're out here and you're a peak performer, you believe you can do anything. So if you say, man, I'm gonna go to Temple, and the naysayers around you, it could be family, it could be friends, well, dude, where are you gonna get the money? It doesn't matter, I'm going to Temple. I will get the money, okay? Well, how are you going to get there every day? You don't have a car. I will walk if I have to go to Temple, okay? These are the people that live their dreams, that do it no matter what, okay? Now go back to the previous slide for me. Let's have that same conversation with somebody who doesn't believe in themselves. So now, I'm going to go to Temple, and your buddy says, dude, your parents don't have any money to send you to Temple. Oh, you're, you're right, yeah. Um, and dude, you don't have a car. Oh, yeah, you know what? Uh, maybe I'll go to community college for a year. All right, I'm out. That's what people do. Little stupid stuff like that. Isn't it crazy? But how many times in your life, how many times have you actually not done something because of a stupid little thought like that? Oh, well, I couldn't this or I couldn't that. You know, I have signed restaurant deals with no financing and had the conversation with myself. Well, now I signed the deal. Now I got to get the money somewhere. Okay? When you're so committed to something, you'll do it. So what you don't want to do is all the junk that you've been told about in your life sort of erase it, okay? Here's what happens, we grow up and our parents say, oh, we're not, you're not as good as your sister at this, or your brother is this, or you always do this, or that's just who you are, or your teacher says, hey, you're no good, okay? You guys know famous people that were thrown out of school, right? Or told they were too stupid, right? Thomas Edison, teacher said he should work for a shoemaker so he can have a career, okay? Henry Ford thrown out of school, Albert Einstein thrown out of school, Okay? What if they listened to that and said, I'm no good, I'm no good? So what you guys want to do is all the negative stuff you've heard about yourself and all the negative stuff you've been told about yourself, your surroundings, your life, erase it. Uh, you know what, the, the thing about regrets living in the past, uh, it's basically worthless. It's like trying to put sawdust back together. And the more time you spend in the past, the more time you spend in negative energy. 
Could we always do stuff better? Yes. Okay. But also what you have to remember is if you have regrets, be it uh, a failed relationship, be it uh, a failed job, a failed this, that, and the other, you should take what you can take to learn from it. Okay. You should take what you should take just to be able to learn from it, but you can't keep reliving that. Did you ever notice you have something bad happen? That's like two minutes in your life. A, a car accident, whatever, okay? You get dumped, whatever it happens to be. You'll replay that two minutes for the next five years of your life, okay? Anybody ever been in a car accident? Okay, right before the car accident, doesn't it seem to last forever? Like you can see yourself in it. And doesn't that replay in your head? And, that, and what is that doing? When you're replaying that ahead, what are you doing? You're bringing up negative emotion, negative hormones, negative chemicals, all the negative things that happened at that time for what? No good. So it's about reprogramming your brain saying, stop, I'm not going to think that. And reprogram it with a positive thought. So yeah, you have regrets. You, you, you know what? In any business, you're gonna, anything that you ever do in life as you're going forward as a rhino, you're going to leave a wake behind you. You are. Okay? Because you're moving forward rapidly. There's going to be some good relationships in your past, some failed relationships. Okay? You can't make everything perfect. Some of them are your fault. Some of those are your fault. I have fired people that probably think I'm the biggest jerk in the world but they weren't helping me get to where my goal was. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So I'm in this to achieve my goal and to have a great life. I'm not in it to compensate for you and drag you along to my goal if you're not doing your job. <laughs> so where do you start? You follow your passions. What do you like to do, Kevin? Um, I like theater, okay. sports. Okay. All right, well, there you go. You're going to have a talk show, a, a talk show on ESPN. There you go. So, no, so here's what you do. You follow your passions down a few steps and you see how you feel. Okay, basically what I call it is just testing the waters. So you start to do something. If it feels good, you do it more. If it feels good, you continue on. When I decided I was going to be a chiropractor, that's what I did. I started to visit a few chiropractors. I said, man, this is cool. I like this. This is pretty neat. I looked at a couple other professions and I was like, no, I, you know what? This still feels pretty good. So if you like theater, you get involved in a theater group. Again, it could be at the school. It could be on a Saturday somewhere. It could be whatever. If you really enjoy it and you're like, man, this, there's some energy I get from this or some great thing, keep going. If it's sports and you find yourself excel at something in sports, then you keep going in it. You know what I mean? So it's really just about what excites me and let me check it out. And then, you know what? What's cool in life too? You guys don't have to have the same job your whole life. I got to tell you, I had a battle with myself. I was 28 years old and I was a chiropractor making insane money. I had to have a serious conversation with myself because I was now no longer passionate about chiropractic. All right, am I going to do this just because of the money, even though I'm not passionate about it, and go the safe route, or am I going to throw away the seven years of school and $100,000 in student loans and start a new career? And I started a new career. And guess what? One day I'll sell my restaurants. I'll sell them, and I'll walk on. And I'll have, it'll be a great memory, but I don't want to be 80 years old saying, hey, I own Kildare's. You know what I mean? Like, I want to go on to what the next adventure is going to be. So you can be passionate about something and do it for a while, and then find something else as well. Yeah, everybody has that, that self out. Now, where did you end up going to school instead of Temple? Uh, well, I actually have decided. Okay. But I'm thinking where I'm Manhattan. Okay. All right. All right. So, and it's in Manhattan? Okay. So, what I would immediately think about is if you still love film and you love doing all this kind of stuff, um, is that that's what you're going to go to Temple for, right? Is that what you want? To, okay. What a better place to be, Manhattan. Right? Okay. It's not the school you want it, but man, you're in Manhattan. Okay. The th that you could, you know, you could end up being the lowest level intern on David Letterman's show. Who the heck cares? That wasn't going to happen in Philadelphia. What were you going to be on the 10 show? Like three people watch that a day. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so it's really great to think about it in those terms of going big. Yeah. See that? See that? Okay. So. Uh, I've had those days where you're like, man, I've, I've had lawsuits, I've had, you name it, I've had stuff just negative bad things happen. And you basically have to take yourself out of it a little bit and say, okay, where am I again long term? What is my big goal here and what do I really want to achieve? So Temple had to feel like a major rejection. But Temple's not the only school that can provide you with what you wanted. And then when you go into another possible environment more positive, your life has maybe gotten better because of that. And that's really the way that I've always tried to learn to look at it, that the biggest setbacks and the biggest failures often hold the biggest positives.
okay? And they get to teach you things you never, ever would have learned, which now means that you, as an adult, have a much better appreciation for how to get somewhere in life because of that setback. If you immediately got in a temple, hey, I'm a superstar. I wrote my goals down. I got in a temple. Everything's great. Well, then you have a setback at temple. Ah! I do okay you've had a setback you've dealt with it you've you've moved on so what you try to look at is every basic failure everything that gets in your way is a learning experience so take the problem say how do I learn from this problem how do I become better at this how do I become more informed and how do I not end up in this position again okay Right. So like when do you think like how how do I keep in mind that I want to do that but still have a career? Well, the thing that you have to realize is uh, most timelines, we put these timelines on ourselves because all of your peers are going right to college and doing this and they're going to graduate at this age and they're going to do this and get their jobs and blah blah blah. We hold ourselves to these sort of milestones, you know what I mean? It's when you want to, okay? So if you would want to take the next year, you graduate high school and you want to be in the Peace Corps and you want to be in Africa for that entire time, getting to see that entire country and culture, that's only going to benefit you academically. If you want to go academically first and then get done school, okay? I was just talking to a waitress of ours at Kildare's in Chapel Hill. Great girl, she's just about to graduate and she's going to go to school, to, to law school. And she goes, I want to do AmeriCorps, but I also want to go to law school. What should I do? And I said, do AmeriCorps first. And she goes, why? I said, you're going to be a much better lawyer after spending a year doing AmeriCorps. So it sort of depends. But what you don't want to think of is like timelines. Like, I don't care how old I am or what I'm doing. I live knowing that I'm never going to retire. Okay? So you can travel the world when you're 80 years old. You can travel the world when you're 20 years old. You can travel it at 30 or 40. You know, I mean, there's just so many opportunities. I didn't go to Europe first time until I was like 20 or 29. You know, I just didn't have the means in my life before that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's never, you're never too old to do either of those. So it's really more about what your passion is, you know. And, you know, sort of who you surround yourself with, too. You make law of attraction, you might find somebody who's like, you know what, I want to go to Italy this summer. And you do that, and then you still start college. But now you've gotten that taste of Europe. Um, I have um, Uh, I'm, I've always had a pretty positive attitude. I would say when you're in college, you can sort of get a bad attitude, like you know it all, or this is the way the world works, or whatever. And you have, a, you have to have an awakening to realize that you can respect other people, and that just college isn't the path, or this isn't the path. The paths to success are all different. But I've always been able to have a positive attitude. A lot of that, I believe, I was raised in a loving home. Uh, we didn't have a lot, but we had a lot of love. So I was always raised, and my mom never, you know, I guess one of the negative attitudes I had to get over that I think a lot of people have to get over is people with money are bad or people who have achieved wealth have done it by ripping somebody off or they're just lucky or, or you know like Mr. Mills talked about uh, Will Smith's son's an actor. So there's people who are like well of course he's an actor he's Will Smith's son. But think of how many actors kids never become an actor or stink at it. Okay? Just because you're an actor's son doesn't mean that you, you're, you get it because you're the son. You have to still be good. You know, so the thing about it is, is realizing that this thought of like a silver spoon or these people have it so much better than us, that's probably the biggest attitude that you have to get over if you come from uh, a middle class.